Okay, so again, for all of our listeners, thank you very much for listening in today. And to our speakers, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to do this with us today. Uh, again, my name is Paul Thaler. I am the Director of External Affairs for the National LGBT Bar Association. And this call-in is to address the general process of how to apply for the judiciary, pointers on how to run a campaign, as well as issues concerning branding. Uh, you're going to hear from two and hopefully three prominent LGBT judges as they talk about their personal experiences and their tips for a successful appointment. So the judges that we have very fortunately on the line today, one is Judge Laura Duffy, who is on the uh, California Superior Court in San Diego, and the other is Judge Vicki Kolakowski, who's also on the California Superior Court in Alameda County. Uh, hopefully we'll get him on the line soon, and that is Judge Stephen Kirkland, who might also be assisting with some moderating, and he is on the Civil District Court of Harris County, Texas. Um, so I think generally we might want to start off with some questions for uh, both Judge Duffy and Judge Kolakowski on um, um, when did you decide that you wanted to be a judge and why did you want to be a judge? So perhaps we could start with uh, Judge Duffy and then take it from there. Great. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I think I first decided that I wanted to be a judge <clears throat> probably um, – pretty early on in my career, but not as an initial step. Um, I, right out of law school, went into the AG Honors Program at the Department of Justice and spent my entire career as a DOJ attorney until I was appointed U.S. Attorney in 2010 by President Obama, and that was for the Southern District of California. But for me, it was a very natural way to transition my public service work uh, that I had been doing as a prosecutor um, on the bench. And that's where I was interested in staying uh, versus going into private practice uh, after leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office. And so that was kind of my path. Awesome. Uh, go, go, Judge Vicki. Okay. Um, well, in my case, oh, no, I see. Um, before I became a Superior Court judge, I was an administrative law judge for the state of California for five years. And so in some ways, becoming a Superior Court judge was a natural transition for me. And um, I probably, I think it would be fair to say that I never really thought of the, that my becoming a judge would be possible, primarily because I started out as a, an intellectual property and transactional attorney. And so I really didn't expect that I would have any chance to, um, to to pass through the appointment process here in California. Let me just explain from the that in California. Well, first of all, let me just say something before I get into the, into all this, which is that um, uh, I am pre this, this, I'm Vicki Kolakowski. I'm president of the International Association of LGBT Judges, and every year we do a session on uh, how to be on. Uh, Pathways to the Judiciary at Lavender Law, which I expect that we'll be doing again this year. So if you're going to be planning on going to Lavender Law, which I hope everyone is, then um, please feel uh, please come to our uh, session there. But um, in California, our judges are elected, but it's a strange situation. Our, our uh, trial court judges, our lowest level is, a, is on a countywide basis, our superior court judges, and we are all elected to six-year terms, but almost nobody gets their seat by election because when there's a vacancy on the court, the governor can fill the vacancy, and almost all of the spots are filled as vacant positions by the, by the governor. And so there's a separate appointment process. And um, I decided to run for my seat uh, for the reason I just said pretty much, which was that my background is not the sort that traditionally um, – Governors would want for uh, for the for the court, and I had um, actually been approached by um, some some attorneys in uh, San Francisco about running there because we, you do not need to live in the county where you serve. But um, I <clears> thought <throat> seeking to have me run against an incumbent, which I did not want to do. But uh, that made me think of that, that was seriously about running for the position. And so I ran in 2008 and was stomped. And then I ran again in 2010 and won uh, in a runoff. And so um, that's kind of uh, 
how I wound up where I am. And uh, let me just say one thing, which is that I'm the first openly transgender trial court level judge in the U.S. There's some confusion about all of this because during the period between my elect my election in 2010 in November and my swearing in to my, when my term began in January, um, Judge Phyllis Fry was appointed a, a municipal court judge in uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, by Mayor Anise Parker, making her the first openly transgender judge. And so, um, some sometimes people will hear this and wonder what all this is about. So, if you haven't heard that story before, that's what that's about. Anyway, I'll move on to Judge Kirkland. So my mother says I went to law school to become a judge, but I don't remember it that way. Um, I thought that I went to law school on a dare with a girlfriend and I lost. Um, so I had a pretty good long uh, career uh, as a lawyer before even thinking about being a judge. I am uh, a good friend with uh, Anise Parker, who you just heard mentioned. Uh, she and I have been advocates for getting openly gay elected and appointed officials in the government for a long time. Uh, when she won city council race back in the 90s, uh, we were able to ascertain that municipal courts were the place where we could get LGBT representation uh, without having to, to get, uh, you having to go through the electoral process. Uh, and it was a good way to make some headway. So we had the uh, positions on the municipal court bench here in Houston that were available, and Judge John Paul Barnish became our first one in the state of Texas. And then in 2001, the mayor needed Denise's vote on something, and I became the second one. So it was purely opportunistic uh, movement on my part in terms of the cause. Um, I served there for uh, eight years and was about to hit burnout point, uh, so it was time to do something different anyway. Uh, and so I entered electoral politics uh, in Houston, had a contested primary. Uh, that was the year that it was really questionable whether a Democrat would win in Harris County. Uh, Harris County is the county in which the city of Houston sits. The city of Houston is about half the population of the whole county. So it's an electorate of, uh, or a population of about 4 million people. And at that time, the electorate was just under a million. Um, so it was a substantial undertaking. In a primary, uh, there was only, uh, anticipated only to be a couple hundred thousand votes. Uh, that year was, of course, the year in 2008 when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were going at it. And uh, we actually had over half a million uh, people vote in Harris County, so it was a huge electorate. Uh, and I won, uh, primarily on the strength of being the first name on the ballot in that position. Uh, the folks that were voting for me personally uh, were the gay community who knew me, but maybe not even all of them at that point. And so it was a, a stroke of luck and being in the right place at the right time. I've actually been in four uh, primaries and three general elections. So they've been contested in three primary elections and three general elections. I, I, the last primary was last year. I, I did not draw a final. In Texas, we run every four years. They're partisan elections, so you get two elections for every cycle, the primary and the general election. Um, the general elections in Texas tend to be uh, whoever's driving the top of the ticket. So if Barack Obama did well, which he did in 2008, everybody on the Democratic side would win. So there wasn't a whole lot I did individually or could do individually campaign there. But the primaries, of course, were a very different thing, and I had to find my own voters. So that's how I came to be on the bench. Um, and I plan to be with Vicki uh, in uh, uh, San Francisco at Lavender Law, so uh, 
if we're unable to answer all your questions about it today, you can talk more and just look me up because I'll be there. And I'll, uh, Judge Kolakowski will be there as well. Uh, I hope you look for us there. Uh, are we ready for the next question, Paul? Absolutely. And Judge Kirkland, if you want to ask it, you can. If not, I am totally cool with asking it, too. Um, oh, why don't I ask this next one? If you have some more from there, feel free to take it. Um, I guess my question for you all would be, um, you know, I think everyone who's been interested in running for the judiciary has had some sort of horror story as a result. At least it certainly seems that way. You know, but also there have been some great parts of it, too. So along with that process, what would you say was the worst part of the experience for each of you? Perhaps you can start with Judge Duffy. Oh, okay. Um, I was just appointed in January, so I'm, a, I'm the greenest member amongst us. Um, and I have not ever run for an election before, but I can just tell you with respect to applying uh, even for an appointment, I think what what anyone will find in that process, in the application process, is it is a very lengthy process. Um, the document itself that you must complete and the kind of information that you need to compile and put forth and do so in a, a grammatically correct way, but in a way that gives enough detail about your person and your background and education and, and work history, uh, but that, you know, that's not too overwhelming. In California, the appointment process um, goes through local committees and then a state committee and then to the governor's office. So there's a number of layers of it. And it's, um, you don't really, I mean, to a certain point, you know where you are in the process. And then after that, um, after it's called the judicial nominee committee here, uh, evaluation committee, and it's goes by the shorthand of Jenny. After it goes through that committee, you don't really know where you are. If you don't hear from them again, um, they've voted on you and passed you on. It could be with the governor's office for five days, five months, five years, um, and you'll hear when you hear. Uh, luckily for me, it was a matter of months, and it worked out. But I know folks who have gone through the process uh, multiple times, and it is something, I think, much like Judge Kirkland said, it's being in the right place at the right time, and you have the right package put together with the experiences of, if it's your governor who is the ultimate shot caller, you know, that you've got a package that is appealing to that governor, to um, ideology, uh, politics, um, and judicial temperament, all those, all those things um, combined. I think that the... Um, there, even if you are applying, there's a certain level of politics to it, but that's the piece that um, is really a, a fine line. How much do you campaign and politic versus you talk to people, let them do your talking for you, and you don't look as if you're campaigning. Yes, thank you for that. Um, Judge Vicki, um, what would you have to say? Okay, so now, tr truthfully, the there there are many different ways depending upon the where you are, what to getting onto the bench. And um, in California, as I said, most of our judges are appointed to an elected position, which is kind of weird. But nevertheless, we have six-year terms, and so um, I and it's a nonpartisan position. And indeed, we, we're not allowed to get involved in anything political. It, it, the rules are pretty onerous in terms, of, in terms of us politically, which is difficult because we have to run, for those of us who, who, who are on the ballot, we have to run an election which has the kind of, of, of issues that Judge Kirkland pointed out which is that um, people who go to the polls go to the polls to vote for people for president, for governor, for various other things. They come in with, with their own partisan agendas and things like that. And you have to run a campaign in California where you pretend like you're not partisan and where you cannot talk about what you're going to do. It's very strange getting endorsements it, um, when you're running for judge here because you ask elected officials for endorsements, and usually what happens is people trade them. We can't trade those. It's, it's, you can't say, I'll, I'll support you if you'll support me. I can't, you can't say, 
support me and I'll do X. All you have to do, all you can do is say, I'm going to be really good and I'll say, oh yeah, I like you and, you know, thumbs up, which is, which is bizarre. So we're, you have to run a political campaign. You have to, an electoral campaign that's not political. The people who know how to run campaigns are all political. Convincing them not to be political while they're doing their job of trying to get you elected is painful. Working without a consultant in a large county like mine where we have one and a half million people and three quarters of a million registered voters is impossible. And so, um, it's, and their tendency is to do everything that is contrary to what you need to do in an election um, as a judge. The tendency is to be vague, to take long, complicated things and turn them into simple statements, to um, to highlight bullet points, um, and it's it, it's it's grueling. The, the, the process of meeting and talking to voters is is impossible. Going through endorsement meetings with various organizations is is just bizarre. And I came into this as an experienced person who's worked within the Democratic Party for many, many years, and there was nothing more complicated or more frustrating than running a political campaign. They're running an electoral campaign that's not political and trying to win an election, especially because everyone else is going to be out there running campaigns. I mean, we just had an election here where we had sitting members of city councils running for judges. And they were like in this, putting bills on in their in their local cities who were in order to try to signal they couldn't talk about how they would be on the bench, but they wanted to show that they were you know they they were they introduced a um a uh, a rent control ordinance or something like that or some pro labor bill and so it's just it's just a very very bizarre thing to go through um the appointment process, which was just alert, alluded to by Judge Duffy, is in some ways a cleaner and perhaps more pure process. But the, the positive part of running in a campaign is, is that whereas you can submit your application to the governor and never hear back or never know what's going on, with an election, one of two, three, four people whose names are filed is going to become the, a judge. I mean, and so... It's expensive. It's painful. We had to more. We had to basically take out a loan on everything we had, and um, I don't regret it for a minute. So I found the process of campaigning both bizarre and uh, highly rewarding. Um, the getting out and being in the community, meeting with people, and talking to people about uh, the law, which is what you do. Um, is is really rewarding. It's loads of fun, uh, and you get to talk oftentimes in really lofty, aspirational things like you know how wonderful the Constitution is. We're a nation of laws, equal process, equal protection under the law. Those are themes that you can sound out that sound really judicial, that strike chords with people. Um, the process of elections was really rewarding to me in that regard. Um, the going out and getting people to do endorsements, most of our elected officials here have become uh, inured to that process, so they understand uh, that I can't do any trading, and they're fine with that. Uh, and for the most part, they will make the same sort of decision that the voters have to make, which is an, an emotional connection to me as a person uh, that tells them that uh, they want to live in a world where I can be a judge. Um, yes, you got to raise a lot of money. Um, I was fortunate. I didn't have to hawk any of my own personal assets. I was able to use the community uh, to build community support and uh, didn't have to do the fundraising stuff. Texas, like California, has this pseudo-appointment process that runs parallel to the election process. But our governor is a Republican. I'm a Democrat, so I'm never going to be on his list. So I didn't have to worry about that. Uh, I think I've answered all I awesome. can say about and, all that. Um, the next question that I want to ask is, and I, Judge Duffy, I know that you were appointed, you know, the first time through. 
Um, but I, I want to ask a question for that deals with campaigning that we sort of touched on, um, but could obviously expand on a little bit. And that still has to do with more with, with campaigning. I, I'm just curious, what surprised you about campaigning? Um, obviously, there's a big financial aspect of campaigning. So I know, Judge Vicki, you talked about that, um, as you did as well. Um, Judge Kirkman a little bit, but can we talk about like you know how much money it takes to run a campaign? Um, what's surprising about it? Um, and, and another way, how does that affect your practice? If you know, for example, if you're in private practice at the time and you have to make time for all of this campaigning, even if you're in the public sector, how do you do it? So um, I don't know who wants to start with this one first. Uh, maybe Judge Vicky, um, but I think that our listeners definitely probably have questions about that. Okay, now how much it costs to run an election in California really depends. Uh, so now, for example, in my county, as I pointed out, we have a, we have three quarters of a million registered voters in my county. So I am um, I spent a hundred thousand dollars on my second race. I spent forty thousand on my first. Um, the candidate who who came in second to me spent about one hundred and fifty thousand. The the guy who lost in in the first round who got forced out um, spent a quarter of a million dollars on his race. Almost at least. Half to two thirds of that money is raised from it comes from the candidates for personal funds. Um, now, in some counties, it's a lot less. In my county, if you wanted, for example, if you wanted to have a ball, a statement put on the ballot, um, we we, they have a, we sent a ballot pamphlet out. And when I ran, the ballot pamphlet statement was fifteen and a half was about fourteen and a half thousand dollars. Um, if you wanted 200 words in the book, and if you didn't pay for that, um, no one, you probably didn't get any votes. And so, I mean, and I had to do that twice. I mean, that's, I mean, even if I didn't have a consultant, I'd still have to do that. Um, and so, and so, um, now it's my understanding in the last election, because this is six years later, um, it's it's up to 20 something thousand. Um, in, Al in Los Angeles County, they don't even take out the statements in the ballot pamphlets because it's too expensive. It would cost them a million bucks or something like that. And so, um, but in a lot of places, that's an important part of cam campaigning here in California. Now, and so this is a big financial drain. I had a friend who ran um, four years ago who was elected, who was, who was a sole practitioner, and that was very, very difficult for her. Um, also, she wound up winning the election in the in the primary in June, and then had to wait until January to start. And she had, she had six months of winding her practice down, which was also a big hit for her because she really couldn't take on new clients. But um, she, you know, which is kind of hard as a solo. Um, I worked for the state of California, but I couldn't get time off, and I wasn't allowed to do any campaigning while I was. I, while I worked that day, so I had to take a vacation day anytime I wanted to, to do anything campaign related during business hours, which was insane. Um, and um, but it, it, it kind of varies, but it can be very disruptive to um, to one's uh, personal professional life to run. Obviously, those people who are appointed don't have to deal with that kind of issue. Very, very true. Um, Judge yeah. Duffy, do you have anything to? Oh, sorry, Judge Vicky, you're not done. No, I was just going to say, you know, unfortunately, I think that Judge Kirkland probably would have some things to add here because he actually runs in a, in a place where they have partisan elections, which they do in many states. Here, we ours are nonpartisan. Yeah. It is difficult to raise funds for a campaign for judge because it's very awkward. Who do you ask? You ask your family, your friends, um, asking attorneys. Uh, that presents really interesting conflict of interest. Um, one of my opponents raised a lot of money from bail bondsmen, which I thought was kind of odd. But um, you know, it's like where do you, who gives money to a judge, judicial race, <clears throat> especially when you're competing for funds in an election cycle with a president, governors, city council members, mayors, all of whom um, have run you know professional political fundraising operations so really you have to rely upon your family friends and people that you know um couple of, i have a couple of comments and i have a question for vicky um sure. 
there, I've had, as United States attorney, uh, many attorneys working under me who um, sought judicial appointments and or ran for election. And those who ran for election um, took leave of absences while they ran for election for many of the reasons that Vicki cited about um, just the time, the constraints and restrictions that are on you if you are serving in a public role, uh, like a federal prosecutor um, or or that nature. They, they too, had to come up with about the same sums of money uh, that were discussed. The the ballot um, statement is a little cheaper in San Diego uh, mm -hmm. than what was described, but the same type of expenses. And I think um, for those in my office who ran, one of the things that I saw them really um, – run up against headwinds is when you run against a sitting judge, the, that sitting judge has an entire community of judges who will immediately support them. And just seeing it happen um, from the outside, I think it's because they don't want to see sitting judges run against as as a you know as one of their colleagues, mm -hmm. and so they're going to do what they can do to ensure that one of their colleagues doesn't lose. Because as soon as one of their colleagues loses, um, you know I think <clears throat> that there's kind of blood in the water, so to speak, and it may um, encourage somebody to run in the next cycle. So that's that's one of the big challenges that I saw a number of my prosecutors run into any time that they chose to run against a sitting judge, even if it was a amicable race, if you will, that they they weren't going after somebody um, tooth and nail. I think that that is something that you really have to consider. One of the things that's difficult is, well, first of all, when you're trying to run a campaign um, as a judge, you can't really run on issues because, well, I mean, the issue is fair and impartial judging and things like that. I mean... It, it, it's so all so nebulous. And so the question is, why would some, that people would have is, why would somebody run against somebody else who's a sitting judge? And often that's because the judge is, has a reputation for being unpleasant or difficult or incompetent or something. And I think that it's often perceived by, um, by those on the bench as, uh, as a statement about those sorts of things. And also about the concern that um, people might be challenged based upon uh, how they rule in cases, whether they're perceived as being <clears throat> uh, pro-plaintiff or pro-defendant, uh, pro-prosecutor or pro-criminal defendant, those sorts of things. Uh, pro, you know, some people might be perceived as being, you know, pro-husband or wife in divorce cases in family law, things like that. And um, one of the things that's that this implicates when you challenge a sitting judge is the question of whether or not you're running a race that attacks the independence of the judiciary. And um, that's almost always how a challenge is going to be framed uh, by, the, by the incumbent as an attack on the judiciary. Often it's meant to be. Um, we've had cases here in California where people have run against uh, sitting judges because they have, well, ethnic sounding names or because um, they might be perceived as not being friendly enough to some interest on the outside or they might be viewed as there was a, in your county in San Diego there was an election a number of years ago where people where some people ran claiming that the incumbents weren't Christian enough and so um, this is one of the this is one of the dilemmas for especially for us as as, as judges as we sit there as you watch as your, if your one of your colleagues gets challenged, is what do you do about that and what can you say about it? I mean, we have a we have an a, a present uh, we have a judge who's presently sitting who's facing a potential recall, um, and you know any of these things that look like they could be attacks on the judiciary. Um, get uh, people's uh, rankles up. But then again, part of it also is, for the most part, just for, for the audience's sake, as I said earlier, most of the people in California who, get appointed, who are on the bench were appointed. They are, these are not people who go through the political process. They don't run for office. And I think that a lot of, of incoming judges are terrified of facing the electorate anyway. And so... Um, I think that that you're really hit on something there with the the fact that um people don't want to people don't want to have a challenge 
uh, whenever the, the deadline, because here in California, if you do not file the initial papers to run against the judge, we're automatically reelected. Our name doesn't even show up on the ballot. And so um, uh, judges will hang out waiting outside the register or our voters' office, waiting to see if somebody pulls papers <laughs> at the last moment just to see if they if they face a potential challenger. And, you know, sort of this, like, sigh of relief goes out every two years when we discover whether or not that anybody's going to be challenged. We haven't had a challenge in my county to a sitting judge in, since consolidation back 20-something, 20 27 years ago or whatever. I mean, 10, 17 years ago. And so there's been none in this millennium. Anyway, so that, does that answer your questions? Does, oh, yeah. I mean, Duffy? I know, Judge Duffy, does that answer your question? Or um yeah i was it, it does i just um i i was wanting to you know just kind of get get somebody's take on that who'd run for election and, and their experience oh no i think that there's definitely something to that and and i do think that, that that in a county for example if you have a county where there's like my county has about 80 bench officers about 70 something judges we have about 20 pe five people up for election every two years you know, the question is, who would you challenge, um, and why? Why me? And so, uh, it's it's a tricky thing. Uh, yeah, and for, for those so time. for those who are thinking about it, you know, think about that carefully. If if you are going to challenge a sitting judge, who are you challenging? Why are you challenging them? And and um, you know, as Vicky alluded to, in California, it's it's not going to be a political debate. And so, I mean, people will, and then the question, here's the thing, one of the things that you should be prepared for, whether you're applying or whether you're, whether you're running, is the first question everybody's going to ask you is, why do you want to be a judge? And if you're running against somebody else, they say, why, you know, if you were running against an incumbent, they will then ask, why are you running against, why are you running against this particular judge? And so, and you have to do this where you, in a race where you cannot be, where we are not allowed, you can't go negative. You can't, the codes of ethics pr prohibit us from doing hits on the other person, from saying anything that's not demonstrably true, from misstating our credentials or the other person's credentials. And so it's very tricky. And so our races are insanely pleasant for the most part, um, <laughs> at least superficially. And, and so you have to be able to answer that question. Why are you why are you running? Or if you're applying, you have to answer the question. Why why are you applying for this? Why what why do you want to be a judge? And that's really the the question that you always have to have center central in your mind. That you have to answer for people um, why you want it. And then the question the the flip side is why would they want you to be? Why would the person who's making a decision about you, whether it's a voter or a, a governor or somebody on a on a vetting committee? would want you to be a judge. And so, Thank you and to, for that. To, to those who are, oh, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, keep going, Judge Duffy. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to say, you know, to anybody who's thinking about it, I think one of the best things to do is to talk to people in your community who have been through both sides of the process, who know the process very well, who know individuals who are involved in the process, whether that's local vetting committees or the statewide committee or people who know people in the governor's office. So you really understand who your audience is at each one of these um, decision points. And part of it is speaking to that audience. And presenting your materials in a way um, that is is directed towards whatever their particular role in the process is. In California, it's very defined along the path if you're applying what each stage of that process is. So um, that's something to just be really mindful of. Make sure you understand where things are going and who's involved so you can direct yourself as well as possible. You know, one of the things that comes up for me every two years when we have an election here is people will run, and I'm stunned that nobody, like, that, that how few of these people call me in advance or, or call even call me as they're starting to run, um, just because of the fact that it was my, when I, when I decided I was going to run, I talked to every person I could find who would ever run. 
um, whether they won or lost. Just because it seems to me that in general, I mean, if I'm applying for a job, I want to talk to people who've done that kind of job. And it just seems like informational interviews and things like that are like such a fundamental basic idea that you'd want to do, but people don't think of it, which just mm -hmm. continues to stun me. Um, and so I agree 100%. Talk to people who know, who know every part of the process you're going to be going through. And ask for advice, and even if you can't, if the person's not going to support you. Well, uh, thank you both for for that bit of that discussion. I know that um, y you all are probably on your lunch break. We have probably about uh, five to maybe eight more minutes left until we have to end today. I have a lot of other questions I would love to get to, so we might have to do a part two for this. But I did get a couple questions from listeners, and so I just want to make sure that I get to ask them. The first one was, and I know, um, Judge Duffy, since you were at the U.S. Attorney's Office for a while, this one seems especially relevant, but one person says that they've only been practicing one type of law for their whole career, and so they're worried that they're not, when they, their state has a judicial nominating commission, and they're apparently worried that um, they're not going to look uh, like they've had enough experience with different types of the law when they go to apply for the bench. Can you talk a little bit about that and how to um, uh, make your, make sure that you seem appealing um, for the bench, even if you've only practiced, let's say, criminal law or civil law, whatever it might be? Mm -hmm. um, well, I do think it is um, it makes you a more marketable um, commodity, and whether you're running for an election or whether you're seeking an appointment to have a variety of legal experiences because certainly um, a judge is going to be dealing with in California, you you know, depending on what your assignment is, and they're going to vary um, over time. Civil experience and criminal experience uh, would be valuable. But I think what you've got to do is you've got to take the experience that you have and see where could I plug holes. There's a couple of things to do here. Where can I plug holes? And um, if if I don't have a practice right now, whether that's in public service or private practice, that allows me to do that, maybe I can partner with somebody who is doing that in my office. Maybe I can volunteer uh, to go pro bono on a case if I've just got civil experience. Maybe I can get involved in the community in some way addressing these issues. Maybe I can get involved um, in a case in a limited way. But I do think showing some effort um, is is going to be good. Now, look, at, I, I think that there are people who get appointed and elected all the time who have one side or the other, and judges coming into um, – coming onto the bench, you you are going to be learning law. And I think as long as you show, um, if you just have the one type of experience, you have an aptitude for learning, that you're an intelligent individual, that you learn quickly, that you can apply acquired knowledge, um, those are the kind of skills that you have to show. Those, those are transferable from my legal practice to my practice on the bench. And what judges do is they make decisions. And they make decisions based on the facts that are impartial, and you show experience doing that. Um, I think another thing that you can do is get involved in your community and get involved in other things, because in in all of the folks, as I, when I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, who ran for office or who were seeking appointment, in my own experience, community involvement and volunteer work and being part of organizations and associations is is an important thing and they want to know at least in the appointment process anyway if you weren't why weren't you what were you doing with your time um, for those who are involved in public service it's a little easier because everything that you're doing is to some extent you know in the community and public service work for those who are in private practice i think that's all the more important so this is Judge Kirk. Let's second what uh, Judge Duffy is saying about community involvement. Uh, in a election environment where you're just going on election, your community involvement is going to be far more important to persuading people to vote for you than your professional background. Um, being able to say I'm balanced and fair is wonderful, uh, but seeing where you've been in the community is what's going to move people towards you and get them to vote for you. Um, and once you're on the bench, you're going to learn a lot and get all kinds of different opportunities to practice and study all kinds of different kinds of law. But you don't have to know it before you get there. 
I think we might have to do a part two to this. Oh, does we anybody have one last thing? Sure, sure. Do, you know, do we have one more? Can we get one more question, maybe? Oh, yes, we can, because I'll, I'll get to one more question then, although I did get a few more. And that question is, and I know that this probably is going to differ depending where you are uh, trying to uh, get onto the bench, but there's the, the question is, do you think being out and proud hurts or, hurt or help your campaign? Um, does it make a difference if your appointment requires an election? That was the question. Um, I don't know, perhaps Judge Kirkland, uh, now that you're back on the line, do you want to start with this one? I will say that it absolutely helps with my uh, getting the election. I was the, the I met, it helped me stand out in the crowd when I was in a crowded primary. So the folks that did vote for me voted for me largely because I was an out gay man uh, who had a long community history. Um, so it helped me a great deal, uh, and it certainly made living on the bench better for me. So uh, there's that to go with it as well. I can tell you that it were, for me, it, this is Judge Kolkowski, it was incredibly helpful and was also a good source for fundraising. But I'll also, but I also, also I'm going to point out that I live in like the bluest of bluest of bluest places. In, in the United States, and so I mean, when you're trying to raise, when you're trying to campaign in Oakland, Berkeley, um, it's not surprising that uh, being out is, a, is viewed as a positive thing. And where we're like like one of probably a, a handful of counties in the country where being a prosecutor is looked at as being a negative. And so I ran against a DA, and that was the biggest strike against him was that he was a DA. And so I mean, we're very far to the left where I am. That might not be the same. I, I, I mean, even and Houston is is a place that that can be quite blue at times. There are some places where I don't know whether whether it will be as successful. But I think it's always important to be yourself. I would echo that uh, last comment. That I think that that's what it really comes down to is being authentic to who you are. Um, you don't want to seem as as somebody who I mean, if you're if you're not out, um, you know that that's an issue for you that you're going to be dealing with. Um, I think that you you also want to strike that balance between um, you don't have an agenda as a gay person on the bench, um, but you are gay and uh, you're fine with that and uh, you live your life as an openly gay person. Um, I, I think is you know I don't know that in San Diego is probably one of the most conservative cities in the state of California. Um, I don't think it hurt me at all, and I think if you're in a liberal state and where if you're being appointed and you have a governor who wants to have a diverse and inclusive bench, um, it's it's probably a non-issue. Awesome. Um, so we did get uh, a couple other questions, and so perhaps I will forward them along to um, your honors uh, when this is done. And I also think that perhaps we should plan a part two just to um, address some more questions that we did not get time to today. But I do want to thank um, Judge Kirkland, Judge Duffy, Judge Kolakowski for taking the time for this call in today. Um, it has been a very informative. 
Um, and I also want to, uh, Judge Kirkland, I'm glad that you were able to work out the fire drill situation. Um, the National LGBT Bar Association can't continue putting together quality programming like this uh, without your, our listeners' continued support. So if you'd like to see more cutting-edge legal analysis, please consider becoming a member of the bar or renewing your existing membership. To learn more, please visit our website at lgbtbar.org. Again, thank you to our listeners for calling in today. Thank you, Your Honors, for taking the time for this phone call, um, and that we hope that you stay tuned for some of the call-ins that we have planned in the near future.